Call the meeting to order at 6.06. Great. On uh, November 16th. 16th. Um, before we go to the motion to approve last month's meeting, I just want to say thank you to Zach. Um, I had called for ambulance um, for the Deerfield 5 to 11 year old clinic tomorrow and the Sunderland clinic on Friday and Zach, and I had to change the time and Zach was 100% accommodating both times and I just you should have heard what he said after he got off the phone. You have no idea. I thought I was on mute, but I guess not. <laughs> it happens to us all. Anyway, it was very, very sweet. And, oh, well, Good. very not professional. And not, I don't want to say. Not His wife might say he's sweet. But just don't tell her that. Mike. Yeah. Uh, he was very, very professional, and we have the ambulance for tomorrow and Friday. So mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, and actually, I've already. Uh, fielded at least one phone call here from a community member who is scheduled to get their vaccine who was asking if we would be there because they were so appreciative of us being there at the last one so oh. yeah wow. yeah okay. and, uh, audible sigh of relief when they heard we were going to be there so. good uh, last one well, minutes entertain a uh, motion motion for last month's minutes motion second all in favor aye, aye. aye. Three, zero. Cool. How about a director's report? Phone's oh, ringing. Sorry. Anybody important? My sister. No. Uh, real quick, our call volume is creeping back up. So we're over 100 calls a month for the third time this year. That's where we were headed while we were still doing. Um, a lot more mutual aid to Greenfield when MedCare and MR transition was in pretty bad shape and we were doing a lot of intercepts. So we, we nixed that, AMR kind of got their ducks in a row, so our call volume dropped down, and then COVID hit and our call volume dropped down way far, and now just internally in our own three towns, we're back up over 100 pretty consistently. So that's just that, I forget what we, it had been like 8 to 12% growth every year in call volume, so um, that's trending up. Um, I, we've been talking for a few meetings now about the full-time staff, and I, it sounds like everybody um, is at the point now where um, it seemed kind of by the seat of our pants pretty obvious. I finally crunched the numbers, and it seems kind of like a no-brainer because it's going to save us money. Um, so I did the FY23 budget both with the full-time staffing as it is now, that model, with the per diems filling in. Um, and the overtime, and then I did the FY23 budget, um, replacing the um, demands on the per diems and overtime with additional full-time staff. And it actually reduces our budget because we're saving money on the overtime, um, and we're also, we've got this um, on-call uh, budget line item for people, $8 an hour to be on call. Uh, we, there are two people in our service area who use that, so most of that money is actually going unspent. Um, and when we do, when they do sign up, it's not going utilized. It, those, those are for overnight calls, they get up out of bed, they come here, um, and we don't utilize it. So I, that money being redirected towards some more consistent staffing um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I ironed it all out in the, in the director's report here, but basically, um, We've always talked about having at least one ambulance staff 24-7, um, and we've done that uh, with this almost 3,000 hour deficit in our own internal full-time staff. And so we use per diems, but they're getting harder and harder to, to find. And when we have somebody out for an extended period of time, whether it be maternity or sick leave, we have another person out right now for a non-work-related health issue. Um, that's another 40 hours a week. That's another 2,000 hours of annually. You know, every week um, that's that we're scrambling and so we've we've had a couple of tough times where say a Saturday morning the per diem person who's coming in they, they work at Northampton for their full-time job they get held over because of a fire and then we have to scramble we move people up from the eve and then we move other people up and we're paying overtime and it causes a circle effect for days so um, filling in that that 3,000 hour deficit with full-time staff intrinsically um, will even that out. Um, it'll also add more consistency within the department. Um, 
and and kind of changing this perspective of what is minimum staffing really. Um, so when you think about what's the staff minimum that we need to do the job that we're being asked to do, we don't even meet that yet. So really kind of focusing on that, making that standard, and that requires those two extra full-time people. And then moving forward, if say another community wants to have a conversation about joining us, we want to start offering more services, it's an easier conversation and calculation to have because we've established kind of this minimum staffing idea, this perspective, and so it makes um, those numbers a little bit more objective uh, as opposed to subjective. Um, when you add, so adding one person isn't enough to fill in that 3,000, so we gotta add two. It actually gives us a little bit more uh, capacity then uh, internally, which means that we can start doing intercepts again, so that'll increase revenue for us. Um, it also means that it keeps our call volume up. So one of the problems with a relatively low call volume service like South County is our providers end up atrophying. So they don't see as many calls during the day, um, and they end up wanting to moonlight someplace else to get those calls or things. So by having that extra capacity, we get to do more calls um, and uh, keep those those skill sets up. So, so Zach, are, are yeah. you saying that you're willing to uh, run it for a year, and if it doesn't pay out, let those people go? I think that. No, well, I, I mean, I'm talking business now, Zach. So you, you know, so you, you have. So what, what is your plan if you, if it doesn't work? I, I guess we need to define what doesn't work means and spending more money without additional services being rented. So, but we're actually spending less money. So I went back and I redid the FY22 budget as if we were yeah. using this staffing model, and yeah. it would have been ten thousand dollars less than what we had currently budgeted. FY22, and that's because we're not spending the money on the overtime um, and the burnout, um, trying to fill those shifts. Um, we're reallocating dollars that are already in the budget. Yeah, right, towards towards bodies here that can respond and cover and that's sick covering, time. That's covering vacation, sick time Correct. cost, and, and yep. insurance costs and everything? Yep. Let me see it. No problem. Thank you. I do want to say at home is and I want to see shifting too. How you run the shifts? I, I don't want to see people. I, I I just want to make sure that we're we're having people gainfully employed and not just. Yeah. So here's here's FY twenty two. Um, this is the. You, you, could you pick a smaller font? No, because these are really complex, <laughs> big spreadsheets um, that do all the math for me. So. <laughs> So what happens is, huh? I maybe well, Zach will send. Zach will email it. I, I yeah, email, email it. Zach. Yeah. So basically, what happens is, so <laughs> for for the overtime, we have, have wait. They have a magnifying on this phone. Like they do. Um, for the overtime, we were budgeted in here for about. Um, I think it works out to twelve hours of overtime per. And per, per full-time employee per month and that is basically being held over coming in for a full shift for an emergency call out that we can't get a per diem in so those are your your less than 48 hours we can't get a per diem because they they're beholden to their full-time jobs so we reduce that down to eight hours or it might have even been six I have to check my more specific notes but we go from we go down on the overtime to only account for basically hold over until the next full timer comes in. So instead of holding somebody for a full eight hour shift or having them come in on a day that they normally wouldn't work, they would fill the gap at the end of their current shift once or twice a month because we have that additional full time person who's coming in on a, on a slight overlap delay. Um, so that saves, uh, that is a difference of 50 times 8, 5 times, uh, it's like 400 um, hours of overtime is what we're, we're saving across all of those employees. Then the... So you're not going to have to cut the shoulders, you're not going to have any more carryovers? There, you still have carryover, not to the extent that they've got now, because with the additional staff, you'll have those people coming in to work as opposed to, oh, hey, the AM paramedic called out, so I need you now to work for the so, next eight hours. So, for example, right now, we have one full shift every week that has to be covered by per diems. That's um, 
because we don't have enough full timers to cover two people 24 seven. So when those per diems can't come in, they get, call, they get sick or they get called out or held over at their other job, we then have a full eight hour shift that we have to emergency fill. And if we don't have the per diems to fill it, then it goes to overtime. And that's, so we're, we're paying eight hours of overtime, sometimes times two in a week, just to fill these minimums having an ambulance that can transport a patient. If we add two more additional people, um, we'd have to really bound, like look at this, but it seems like the most logical thing would be to have each of them do four 10-hour shifts, which would then overlap on, so four days on, three days off, and then they would overlap on Saturday, which is the day that we currently don't have any full-timers working. So you would have full-time coverage seven days a week, and they would come in um, basically like an impact shift. So they would come in from 8A to 6P. And so when the day shift comes in at 7 normally, right now, because we don't have enough full-timers, if the day shift calls out in the morning or calls out before their shift, 5 a.m., 4 a.m., um, something like that, um, if we don't have a per diem, we blast it out to per diems. If we don't have them, then the person coming off of their 16-hour shift basically has first right of refusal um, to stay on for another six hours until the evening can come in two hours early and we're paying overtime for that full eight. With the additional full-time staff working in 8A to a 6P, that overnight shift just holds for an hour now. Um, and that is, in public safety, um, it's really common to be held. Um, usually it's for an emergency, or, or, but it's when you have capacity in the system, you hold them a little bit until their relief comes in. And this also increases morale because, you know, it's never like, oh, geez, if the 7 a.m. calls out sick, I'm here for another eight. It's, oh, the 7 a.m. calls in, I'm only here for another hour. And I know that somebody reliable will be in on the back end. Um, when we don't utilize those people to backfill sick times, vacation, things like that, they are also an impact shift during the day, which we've already shown that we need for our higher call volume time. And our policies right now are we do an intercept or we provide intercept services when we can provide it and not drop down below one ambulance available to our three towns. So basically right now, like we can never provide intercept services. So we don't want to be up in another community as a second ambulance and then miss calls here. With the additional full-time staff, then we have that capacity, we can start doing that. So Hatfield has asked us to be providing intercepts for them. Conway has asked us to provide intercepts for them. Um, Hadley to a little bit of extent, and we've been going to Amherst a couple times um, recently just because of increasing call volume on their end. So by having that additional capacity normally now, we can start providing those services. Greenfield as well are coming down, um, usually about coming down the trail. I should finish that thought. Usually about twice a week now, Shelburne Control will call me and ask me if we're available for intercepts. And that's because they're looking at their board, they're seeing who's available in the county. Um, and basically the answer is no one, and so they reach down to us and say, we know your policy is that you don't. Is there any chance you have full staffing today? And by full, they mean like additional staffing and that you could provide these services. And occasionally the answer is yes, we have an impact, I'm here, we, like, we've got enough staff on hand. But usually the answer is just no, that we're, we're too busy trying to cover our own calls. Um, and make sure we're available for that. Uh, to circle back to your question, I think I wouldn't be proposing this if I didn't think it was, it made good fiscal sense, um, good operational sense, um, looking towards the future with our department as well. Uh, it's definitely gotten tough in the last 12 to 16 months. There just aren't the per diems there. And the per diems that we do have are beholden to a different master. And we're being asked to cover one ambulance 24 seven um, at, at a bare minimum. We're not talking about impact. I'm not talking about vaccine clinics. I'm not talking about football games. I'm not talking any of that. Just one transporting ambulance 24 seven. And there's been a couple times in the last eight months where for a four hour block on the overnight, we have to go down to one person just because we don't have the staff to fill in these, these gaps. So, so when, when, you run, when you run your sh impact shift now, 
are you staffing paramedic level or are you staffing EMT level? The goal is paramedic level. We have a mix of paramedics and basics on our per diem roster. And um, okay. I, I try to be fair and equitable. Um, a lot of those basics are in paramedics right now. And with me here during the day, I am a paramedic. So even if that impact person is a basic, we can staff that as a paramedic level. So, so I, and I, I, I ask just because, so when you have, when you're, when you're doing a clinic, right? Are, are you using paramedics or EMTs for clinics? It depends on what the staffing level or need is in the department that day. We only have, of our three ambulances, two are equipped to provide paramedic level service. So, um, usually what will happen is we will send a paramedic over to the clinic. Yeah. So if somebody has an anaphylaxis reaction, the paramedic is there. Yeah. Um, and the person who remains here will be in the third BLS truck. If additional or multiple calls in come in during the day, we can juggle crews around. We can dispatch. Like back we get all these questions. We can, so we can, basically what we can, what we're ostensibly doing is we're mobile posting the paramedic unit at the site of the vaccination clinic, but if they are needed elsewhere, they can respond from the vaccination clinic and then the basic level truck can come in. So do, you, do, do you have enough people? Do you have enough EMTs and on your on your roster? No. No, and All right, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. So right now, you, when it comes to staffing a department like this and you, utilizing per diems, you have two options. You can either be appropriately staffed on your roster, how deep that roster is, most of the time, and occasionally have too few people and be scrambling and trying to fill in and panicking and last minute wheeling and dealing. But what that means is when you're appropriately staffed, most of the time when people are put in for shifts, say they put in for five or shifts, five, four or five shifts a month, they consistently get three or four of those shifts. So it keeps them coming back to the well. It keeps their faces um, recognizable. Um, they know the community. They know all those things. The other way that you can staff, and this is typically how like your private services, your AMRs, your BHSs, they do it. What they do is they overstaff most of the time. Their roster is way too big most of the time. So that way they never get to a point where they don't have anybody. The problem with that is they have a very high turnover because people aren't getting the number of shifts that they want to get. Um, so they stop coming to the well, they start finding other services, they go find full-time jobs someplace, they use those as entry-level roles to find a full-time job. But those larger companies can handle that amount of turnover because they are global companies and they have infrastructure and they just Every month, every six weeks, they have a new orientation class and they train 12 new people with a brand new card and they have enough supervisors in the field and enough oversight that nobody's ever practicing by themselves or just one partner in the middle of West Waitley at 2 a.m. with a volunteer fire department. Um, if in Springfield they have a brand new EMT basic with 20 hours of experience and they get a hot call, they just send a supervisor. And if that person screws up, they just fire them because in two weeks they've got another class coming through. So those are the two ways to do it. And based on the size of our department, the resources we have for training and orienting people, um, appointing them as a municipal employee, all those things, and what we're asking them to do, which is potentially be, and I'm going to use this word, it's going to come out a little weird, the only like professional full-time emergency responder potentially on a scene on an emergency scene that we can't afford to have that kind of brand new EMT turnover. And so the decision has been made by me that I would rather occasionally be struggling to find somebody to fill the shift here or there um, than to have too much turnover with, with, too, few, um, with too new people. A um, Couple other things to add to this. When we started this, our instructions to you were to go light on the full-time staff to make sure 
the existing EMTs that were in the three organizations had plenty of opportunity to work. We were also told by Bruce, when we went through this whole thing, over time, you're going to see your per diem staff reduced down. So we're at a point now, and, and COVID threw a monkey wrench into this, as it did many other things. So we're at a point now where calls are coming back. We delayed the inevitable last year over the past year and a half due to COVID. Calls are beginning to come back. You're starting to struggle a little bit on the staffing piece. The number, and you can have, you can have 500 per diems, but if none of them have availability to come help you when you need it, 500 does you no good. So you're at a point now where you're looking to get those full-time bodies in, so they're committed here. You can fill the shifts, need what you, do what you need to do without burning people out. The other thing that figures into all this, and I've been reading up, fortunately I had some time on my hands, been doing some reading up, and as you look at the medical profession in general, they're struggling to get LPNs, CNAs, EMTs, paramedics. Communities down south are offering hiring bonuses Five and ten thousand dollars to get people to come work because they're in crisis mode. I don't think we're in crisis mode yet, and I applaud what you're trying to do, trying to head that off. My other concern becomes, and I've said this all along, you've got folks who are working long shifts, and granted, there are days where you don't turn a wheel and days where you're going all day long, but when you're coming off of your 16 hour shift, and somebody knocks on the door and says, hey, we need you to work another six or eight hours, it makes for quite a long day. And I, I, I've been through the arguments on both sides of it where firefighters will tell you they do 24 on and 24 off and it's not a big deal. And I'm sure some of you folks here will say it's not a big deal. I'd rather err on the side of caution. If somebody has to or we ask them to pick up that overtime, great. I think it's a different situation when you've got to go to them and say, hey, we've got nobody coming in, can you stick around, as opposed to, can you work an extra six hours at a vaccine clinic today? Yeah, I, I think there's, that reminds me too that the, the per diems, these aren't just people who don't have jobs, that are, are hungry for hours and will work them if they can get them. These are people that have full-time EMS jobs. In order to be a per diem EMT or paramedic, you have to have, you have to be a full-time EMT or paramedic usually a firefighter someplace else. And so every hour they pick up here, it's on top of their 40 hours they're already working someplace else. And a lot of them, just with COVID, with the burnout, things like that, are not willing to do that anymore. And those that are, if they're presented with overtime at their full-time job versus you know, oh, why would I work Christmas at South County because I don't get overtime and I don't get holiday pay when if I, you know, pull another shift at my normal job, I'll get all the extra benefits. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess the, the, my, my only, and, and I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I also know that there's, there's a, there's still people in the community that volunteer that that would like to be involved and, and I don't know if we're doing enough outreach to find those people and that and, and I don't know if we're or I don't know if we're letting people I don't know if we're letting people in our towns know that there's still positions for EMTs at South County and that and you know and I think it'd be a great selling point and, and I I just had the opportunity to walk around with a bunch of EMTs at UMass the other night. And I said, well, have you guys ever thought about taking shifts at UMass? Uh, but, you know, mass EMTs ever take shifts at South County? I said, oh, what's South County? And I explained, he said, oh, that sounds like an interesting thing. And I guess what I'm saying is that we, we, we should still talk to our people, put out ads, flyers, whatever, and say, hey, look, if you're if you reside in our town, South County would be willing to put you through school, like you used to do, right, David? I mean, put put you through school, and and maybe you could pick up four, five EMTs, newer ones, because they haven't been burnt out yet, and and bring them into the thing that would help you cover. And and, and again, because I still think. Bobby, when, when, remember that October storm that we had 
10, 15 years ago. The only reason we came through was because Bobby and his crews were available. Nothing against professional staff, but they're professional staff. They don't live in the town. So they may not, and, and I know I know you and myself getting, you know, they, they, people may live in Irving or, or Northfield, and they may not be able to get to the university. So, but here is the same thing. You, you probably have people from all over the place. Well, if something happens in Sunderland and, and the bridge goes down, who do we get? Zach, you can't get across the river. We, no, we don't true. we don't have that we have the fire department but we don't have that back but even in the our roads communities. even the roads just you know that snow tober cut off the roads communities absolutely. were absolutely isolated yeah I'm, I'm sorry i have to leave for another meeting but um i just want to in homeland security meetings this morning we were talking about the shortage of the emts and um the you know OMS, oems is you know, had sent out these letters, and, you know, it was just really not, you know, about doing transfers and yeah. you know, in the hospitals, and no one's doing them. Because nobody yeah. has any capacity whatsoever. So, all I could say is, listening to the conversations, I was like, thank gosh, we have a, we had organized and, and got our EMT, you know, service going, because we are so lucky. We are the only we really are one of the few communities that have reliable EMTs. Uh, and I, and I, and I, the only thing I'm saying is that I, I think we should do, we shouldn't be afraid to do more, a little more outreach, and 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 say, okay, you know, we're going to pay for your schooling, and, and you know, I agree. You know, and, and again, I, I, and again, it should be okay to have, you know, EMTs, whatever level, basic, intermediate, but to ride with Zach. To get that experience, and, and if they want it, if they want to volunteer, yeah, we we'll pick up some money, and, and it helps. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is a capacity issue, so I think it is wonderful. Yeah, if we're gonna if we're gonna pay for schooling, we need some kind of a commitment because we've Absolutely. been down this road before, I, I, where yeah. we've paid and somebody graduates and they're gone. I want to say um, we do with our cops, so you know we're. I think we have a three-year when they go to the full, if they yeah. go to full right. full-time we academy, we have a thing on the back. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but, it, but it's fair, and, and we've never yeah. we've never had a problem with well, those guys because of this sorry, if, you, if you go leave right. after one year, well, you owe us eighty percent of yeah. the cost. After two years, sixty percent. You know, uh, I will say so. Um, over the past few years, when we have a new, I, there's a you can pull a report from the state and see all the EMTs and paramedics that are like their addresses are in your coverage area, yeah. um, and so I've got visual on who those people are. I've reached out to them. Um, we get people reaching out to us looking for, usually for full-time employment. Um, and over the years, when we have a new EMT who lives in our coverage area, um, particularly, and they, they voice interest, we will, we will bring them in. We have found that when somebody has less than a year of experience, mm -hmm. um, they struggle um, with the requirements and the demands of oh, South course. County. Um, and so that has been one thing that we've I've had to tighten the noose on when it comes to hiring new people mm -hmm. is really look closely at what their experience is because um, without without them working and getting experience someplace else with closer and tighter supervision and more units and a higher call volume, they come here and they don't have the tools to succeed here that we just, it's too steep of a learning curve and we actually end up setting them up for failure. Uh, and so we've had to change the way that we orient people and also be a little bit more selective when somebody says, yeah, I've got four, uh, like zero experience. Um, if there are EMTs at UMass EMS, th things like that, absolutely 100%, they should reach out. Um, they get 25, 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I mean, but, but Zach, just let you know, the first time I walked on a ship, I went to four years of college. I had a third engineer's license. Guess what I knew? But those guys mentored me. Sure. If I, and, and I would expect that you guys yeah. would be, I don't think South County EMS is so much a higher than everybody else that you can't spend the time mentoring it's, people to become it's, good EMTs. It's, it's not that we're so much higher, it's that we're so much smaller. And we found that when we have multiple calls or multiple patients on a scene and there are three people there, two experienced and one inexperienced, a brand new EMT, and you have two patients, three patients, 
what ends up happening is the experienced providers are, their attention is now divided mentoring and without, I'm gonna bring it back to this, if we had a, that additional full-time staff capacity during the day where that brand new EMT would be paired up, teamed up with an experienced provider and they, they would be working together um, and that person would be responsible for them in that way. Um, that, that is how you make it work on a ship, like on a bigger ship, you've got more people, you've got a, a, deeper, a deeper bench to work from. Um, and, that's, and that's really where we find people struggle, that they clear orientation, we think they're ready, and then the, it's the first time they see a CHF call, because our call volume is low enough here, they're so far out of precepting because they never got a chance to see it during their orientation that um, it's it, we're, we're behind the eight ball trying to make up. And that's usually why I say get your cut your teeth at, at another service where you're going to see at least everything once in that first year. And so when you come here, there's some context mm -hmm. for, for what you're being asked to do. Um, the other tough part is I'm like on a ship, and I, I don't pretend to know what goes on a ship because I've never been on something bigger than... You see what I drive, but um, very nice. One thank too. you. But um, with the EMS, you know, you you'll ride together in the front of a bus, get to a scene, work together to get a patient assessed and loaded. And once they're loaded, then the team splits. One of one of you has to drive; the other one's in the back. So you lose. If there were two, if both were in the back together, it'd give more time to kind of walk through all that. Yeah. Instead, it's. You know, hurry up quickly, assess, get them loaded, let's get them in the truck, and then, all right, well, new guy, you go drive, because I know you can do that, and I'll stay yeah. back here and handle it. And, and I will say, I, I, I pride our orientation and precepting program here. We put a lot of effort into it, and it's, it's actually been used as a model for a lot of the other agencies uh, in the area with minimum requirements and standards and testing, and, and, and it's tiered. You know, you shadow somebody as a third person for your first... 20 hours or 60 hours depending on your level of certification and then you are still being mentored and precepted but you're part of a pair and then once you clear all of that stuff then you are allowed kind of um, your freedom to fly but um, yeah I, I think it, it's I mean it's I don't think it's it's not unique to us that there's just trying to staff an ambulance with EMS I mean West County, they're still they're pushing legislation for one first responder, one EMT. We talk about all the time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so and that's just because they're struggling to even turn the wheel occasionally. So no, they they talk about it still, and and they think they can't. I mean, and, and think about it. I mean, if they get if they get one uh, paramedic in or an EMT, they just want somebody to drive the the, right. the bus. Yeah, right. And we we made that argument years ago, and I still feel strongly that the state should. The state should be given some latitude in areas where it's needed to come in and grant temporaries, maybe have some stronger oversight, and let them continue on. And, and the state's got a better way to, to recruit and hire. Let them come in and help. Oh, I'd rather have an ambulance than no ambulance. I, I agree. I, and that was my argument years ago. I'd rather have an ambulance with an ENT who can treat me in the back and a firefighter or a police officer driving it and to have that ambulance stuck at the station <coughs> or stuck on scene with an EMT in the back waiting for another EMT to come drive it when, to drive. when I've got truck drivers and, and firefighters and police officers who are more than qualified to drive the damn thing and you're not legally allowed to take it out of the driveway. To answer the question you asked, yeah. which, which was in a year or two, will we be willing to eliminate these full-time positions. Yeah. I think the short answer is yes, of course, just in the same way that this on-call shift that some people are making $1,000 a week doing, we are eliminating because it doesn't make sense for us and it is we, that money can be better utilized someplace else, either going towards something else or going back you know, to the taxpayers. And, 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 and why I ask that, Zach, is because you're doing something different first time whatever you want to call it okay but you have to you have to we not you but we have to be resourceful enough nimble enough to make the changes if they're if they're changed and and and, and some some, com some companies will just hire 
and the first year they'll put you as a temporary, temporary, temporary full time, right? Mm -hmm. So you get all the benefits and everything, but you're on, you're, you're temporary, and they, they want to see, they want to see if there's enough, the work continued, blah blah blah, whatever thing. But you have to be you, and and I hate to bring on people and not not make them a positive force in the department. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and you say better morale, I'll tell you what, one of the hardest things to do is have people around, sitting around doing nothing. And that is not a good morale situation. Right, right. To, for the typical employee. I, I, 100%, right, mm -hmm. right. So. Um, yeah, which is uh, why, which is why I like that the additional capacity in adding those two people opens up those opportunities to to take on that extra work that is just over our borders here that they have been asking for and we've had to turn down because we, we don't have the staffing to do those types of things. That, that idea that because an ambulance requires two people to be available, you have to add it in blocks, right? Um, and so, you know, we're we're half a block short right now, and so you got to add a full block. But it means that we've got a little bit of that capacity to to have them do more work during the day, have them do more calls, provide those services to Conway, to Hatfield, to Charlemont, even coming down Route Two, um, those types of things. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you all those numbers. I I crunched them again and again and again because that's actually. Uh, I need at least 12 font. Yeah, no problem. Can well, you read this? I'll give it to yeah. you. Maybe this this far away you can read it. It'll right? be electronic. You can like you can zoom all, all right. the way in as so much as you want. Up. Um, and it really is. I the the secret sauce there is that we're reducing the overtime, but also we're reallocating those funds that are going unused or not smartly used towards something that'll make a, a better impact. Um, and, and so, so that was the punchline, right? So I did FY23 both ways, found that by making those changes, we actually save money. So then I redid the FY22 budget. Um, and had we enacted these changes for the beginning of the year, we would have saved $10,000 on the bottom line. Um, and that's why my recommendation here, whether your motivation is expanding services, whether your motivation is improving morale, whether your motivation is just simply coming in under budget, um, it seems a no-brainer to me to move forward and make those changes, hire um, two additional full-time people to cover the minimum 24-7 ambulance um, and eliminate our dependency on outside per diems that we just don't know if we can get and aren't getting anymore. I think the key to the whole thing is the number of calls, and the number of calls is just going to keep going up. If you've got two more full-time people, you're going to have a bunch more calls. Right. You know, like you said, with the intercepts and yeah. mutual aids. Yeah. Um, I think. I, I assume that you figured benefits and everything into your analysis. I did. Yeah. My. My. I, I would need those numbers specifically from the front office. Um, my calculations, my formulas, always come in about $50,000 high. Um, and so I think, let me see where it's, I think, well, it's one of those games when you estimate the benefit, you estimate everybody taking the most expensive year. packages. Yeah. Uh, and then as you bring people in, some of them, it's only a single, some is only a single Divide spouse. Last year's benefits by how many? My benefit calculations employees. for for twenty two were two hundred and sixty four thousand, and then Brenda's like, "Yep, it's going to be two hundred and eight. And I go, "Okay, like, mm -hmm. like, thank you." Uh, these but numbers sure are also sixty four, right? Yeah. Um, and and these were all. I'm going to say worst case. So I calculated the FY twenty three budget as if everybody's getting a step. And then I also calculated those three hires as a step three. That's like worst case. Um, so obviously all those numbers I, were, are going to be. The biggest problem we've had with most of the budgets in Deerfield, especially, is that we've always under budgeted for retirement. 
And that's why it's all transparent with South County. Um, that's why we are making OPEB, um, you know, like, yep. the, yeah, we're trying to, yeah, I mean, you're right, right. We're trying to be totally open about that mm -hmm. and being, being honest about what the actual real cost of this is right. and, and, and going forward. Mm -hmm. um, what else you got on the budget? Peter, on your report. Well, you talk about budget. One of the things that I really found interesting, and I appreciate you keeping all the history on this, mm -hmm. going back to 2015, assessment to member towns, assessment to the three towns was just shy of $750,000. The assessment in 2022 to the three towns was $597,443. So it's $150,000 less than when we started in 2015. Next year, you know, on the initial budget, it looks like it goes up a little bit from there, but we're still way under what it was when we started this. Um, and if you, to your point about the retirement, if you go across on the retirement line, it started out at 68,150, and in 2021, 113,445, and then up to 124,950. So mm -hmm. the retirement is almost doubled. I, and I think our staff has tripled since 2015 because we started with the three full timers when when Baxter said you would need eight plus the on calls and the locals right. and all that. So, as far as cost to the member towns, I mean, I would challenge any other department in any other town to tell me that they've reduced their costs and provided better service than what they did when they started. Mm -hmm. But it's my, always been unique about the EMS service when you're getting ambulance revenue. Right. Nobody else gets revenue like we do. I understood. So that, and, 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 and that's, and, and my, see, I'm, I'm, I, I believe that it, it, we are, and again, maybe it's just because we, we were all basically around from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we, we remember those original conversations. And and it's ingrained in me is that we want to give the best service we can most efficiently. Not sure. cheap. Sure. Efficiently. Right. And and that's why we that's why we question everything. That's why to me about when we talk about dollars that haven't been collected, I understand why they're not collected. Sure. Okay. So I because I, I as a selectman in our old town in the old town we had to deal with them, right? Mm -hmm. And we didn't we didn't want to make it a political thing, so we had our, our, our ambulance director, he made those, and, and I think that was the best way to do it. That that being said, I knew why we were doing it, because there, there, there are people that can't pay those bills. Sure. And the ambulance director in this case was a much better than the select one, because the select, select board member, you can, you wouldn't, it, it didn't make a, it didn't make any sense because it because it become political at right. that point. Well, you didn't do it because of you do you don't like me. Mm -hmm. Well, our our EMS directors they didn't like anybody, so it didn't matter. Well, at the end of the day, hire <laughs> hire good department directors and let them run the departments. Uh, we believe in that, but yeah. that's not a universal. I that's, uni that's not universal concept. I agree. So, so, so for me, questioning Zach is just a, 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 something that we do because the, and the day that we stop is probably the day that our communities don't longer trust us doing our job. No, and it's it's all it's right? nothing political. It's it's I, fair and fact-based questions. We're trying. You're trying to make sure we're making the right on. decision for the service. Uh, my rules for the paramedics are that their actions are defensible and articulable, right? And so, like, if right, I if. If you weren't asking these questions, if we weren't having these discussions, then what are we here for, right? If we can't defend and articulate we don't, why. We don't want to be, and again, Zach, I don't want to do your job. Um, well, feelings mutual. Uh, and, and again, I don't because I, I never, when, 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 I, cause when I went on the, Especially when I went on the ship, they taught me how to give somebody a shot. And, they, and this is a scalpel, and I go, <laughs> you want me, yeah. a you want me to do surgery? Okay, so I mean, you that, rich instead. You know, you you got a you got a bottle of aspirin. That's all. Uh, that's right. what we, we can take care of anything with aspirin, mm -hmm. 
or shot a penicillin. So, yeah. but but again, I just think that you know we we have to try to our our we're charged with trying to run the best service possible, most efficiently. Right. So. Director's report. Yeah. Um, um, one less. Um, yes. Capital. Yes, sir. No, there's no, there's none for FY23. No expenditures. Okay. Unless you want to buy something. You want to buy something? Yeah. I saw you taking, or we're planning on taking out the money that we stash every year for the ambulance. So we should have that conversation. Um, Let me take it out. No. Not. We're not taking it out. He just wasn't going to request it in capital as you have in the So past. normally what happens is, so we... Earmark. We estimate a certain number of uh, amount of billing revenue. Yep. And I estimate an amount to weather like things like global pandemics. And when we have revenue over that estimation, it goes back into the enterprise fund. We need a wh whiteboard now. And oh, yeah. You want the whiteboard? And that that money goes back into the enterprise fund as retained earnings. And then what we do is right, we earmark a, a portion of that every year, so then over four or five years, we have enough to replace an ambulance. Um, we experienced a global pandemic. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. No, I haven't. No, no. What's that about? Uh, I, well, you know, it actually Your wife knows about it. It didn't. So yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and so what happens is our, like our, our revenue for FY21, so the retained earnings that we have, is at, was actually $100,000 less than what we would normally get. It was still just above what we had estimated, and so we didn't have to dip into operational reserves or anything like that. And we can estimate so low because the money goes back into the enterprise fund and just reduces assessments the following year. So it's, it's just kind of like, just like the... Um, the uh, operational reserves, it just kind of feeds itself, right? Um, because that dropped so much and we had such lower retained earnings, we had less to go back to the FY23 budget to lower assessments. And so we've got, where did I? I definitely have it someplace. Um, the if we put the <laughs> sorry we're having a retained earning conversation again huh we don't so go there. so historically like so in FY twenty one and twenty two we put in about three hundred thousand like two hundred something thousand three hundred thousand dollars of retained earnings back in. Because we saw such a drop through COVID, we don't have, we had about $100,000 less to put in, which was going to spike the assessment to the member towns. We replaced the international um, recently. You saved a boatload of money on maintenance. 100% on that. And also, because both of those trucks are so reliable now, the third ambulance isn't getting used nearly as much. That was in pretty steady rotation all the time because the, when the international was going down. Now that it's not, it's not as imperative that that be replaced, okay. you know, in the next two or three years or whatever. So, but I don't, I'm, I, I'm not a believer in reducing too much. Okay. So this, this is a good conversation to have because I would like some insight from the Board of Oversight about how we, because if we, I would love to continue putting the standard amount of money away from the retained earnings into that ambulance replacement. I think we will have enough money, well I think that truck will probably, we could make it last longer than we would reach the point which we have enough to replace it, but if we don't put that money here, we are going to have to defend um, to the towns why the assessment, instead of going up, uh, where are my notes? You can go down. No, the total assessed to member towns, okay. So last year the total assessed to mem member towns is $597,443. If we continue to 
make the exact same um, earmark for the ambulance replacement. Mm -hmm. The FY23 assessment will be closer to like 700,000. It's, it's basically... So basically the thought is don't put the, don't put the earmark for the ambulance in for fiscal 23 and then reassess it at the end going into fiscal 24 based on fiscal 23 results and if we needed to we could push that number up yeah to I think catch us up. yeah what I had done here was I basically we are now weathering the COVID storm in this budget and so if we want to keep assessments relatively stable we have to tighten our belt and it seemed to me like the place where we could tighten the belt aside from the money we'll save by hiring two more full-time people, would be to delay the replacement of that ambulance that is now not being used nearly as much as it had been in the past, you know, another year. So, so that, that was a conversation I think we should have been, and we have been having right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because what is, a, what, is, what is an accurate cycling time? What does it look like? So, right now we're re we're, we were saying that you have to replace all the amb or replace an ambulance every <coughs> ten years, right? Or seven? The or ten? I thought we were between five and seven. I don't know. Well, well, and, and again, and, and, but but that's why it's important yeah, right. because now because now what we're learning if we have rely and and again these are relatively new so you don't know long term the reliability. Right. That being said. That third ambulance, it may it could be a little bit older. It yes. could be a twelve year old. So well, it's a two thousand six, right? Seven. Uh, seven. Or two thousand seven. Well, so you, it's you, already fourteen going yeah. fifteen years old. Oh right, but and but that's what that's what I, but that's what I'm saying. Maybe that, now that third ambulance can be a, and you're going to have a more dependable setup truck. Our, our ambulance inspector looked at that truck with a magnifying glass for cracks in the frame in the body. Because he goes, after 10 years, he goes, they start showing up. And he was shocked when he didn't find it on that truck. And it's because it, it's not getting used as much. But, I agree. He, but he said 10 years is usually when you start up to worry about that. The, the funds that I had been earmarking, the amounts were for a new ambulance every four years, which meant your frontline truck is never older than four years old your second line truck would be up to eight years old, and then your third line truck would be replaced at the 12 year mark. And so you would replace your oldest truck basically every four years, and with three trucks. Um, so it'd be a four year rotation and they'd slide back in position. Yeah. So the oldest truck would get to 12 years and then go down the road yeah. as the next new one came. Yeah. Um, I, right, we're at, what did we decide on that one? It say it's a 2007? 15. Yeah, I, I mean, that truck's, that truck's tired. That truck is, when we turn the flashy lights on and you pull out of the station, you come out on a five and 10 and everybody stacks up behind you because you can only go 35 miles an hour until the transmission warms up and then you can take off. Um, that truck is great for football games. That truck is great for vaccine clinics, things like that. And that's where it is being used because our other two trucks, which we replaced already, are reliable and they aren't going up. Um, they aren't going down. Um, the only time that Sunderland truck comes up to um, more active service is when one of these is down for like an oil change or brakes or something otherwise temporary. Mm -hmm. um, the other thought is COVID brought up a lot of increases in everything and trucks and ambulances are going to take a big jump too so that's a good point I think Chips. You ought to keep putting away money for it well okay I will this is the first draft right so I will I will prepare a second one with with the numbers the other way and we can and then if we want to split that difference or do something then we can certainly do that um, yeah as long as we're putting yeah you know, I wouldn't pay less than half of what you know we'll do okay only because I, I, I would happens. agree with David I, I would and, and, and maybe that and maybe that's <laughs> enough maybe that maybe that's a number that we you know maybe it, 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 we don't need to go the whole yeah. in the future maybe we'd go half to three quarters of that yeah. but we 
but again, we should we we need to know. And here again, it's be flexible enough you know, to make those decisions. You know, decisions. You know, with Deerfield, I've seen it where. Okay, we'll start reducing this, and they always want it reduced, <laughs> and trying to get it back to where it should be. Yeah. You know, it's like our sewer plan. You know, it's we got so far behind because nobody wanted to spend any money for 20 years. Yep. And people in Deerfield get amnesia when it comes to reduced costs. That's why I wanted to yeah. bring up the fact that when we started this, the assessment to the three towns was $750,000. Yeah. The assessment in the current mm -hmm. fiscal year is 597000 so it's a $150,000 decrease. So even if that goes back up, Mm -hmm. 633. It, it's really, 633 yeah. now. Yeah. If yeah. it goes up to $700,000, we're still $50,000 below where we were when we started this thing. Started, yeah. So, and again, that's weathering through COVID, which impacted revenues. Because the other thing that's going to happen is, going back to your earlier statement, when you start adding the people, you're going to be looking at more calls. Mm -hmm. Right. So your usage is going to be going right. up. And the wear and tear is going to be going up, so you, we might start dropping that back yep. to that twelve-year assessment that you originally had. Right. Right. So right. Uh, I just, you know. Yeah, this is all great stuff. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to think and keep things tight. Yeah. But I want to make sure we don't shoot ourselves in the foot and at least have the. And if if we decide to go that route, we need to make a clear statement to the finance committees in all three towns. We have pulled this back for this reason. Be forewarned, <laughs> in the next couple of years, yeah. that's going to go back up to make up for it. Keep on, keep on. There's no matter. I know. <laughs> that's why we're going to put it in statements. We're going to submit it to the finance committee. So we're going to keep a copy of it. So when they get amnesia, we gave this to you. Here, this is what it says. Well, I don't care. I don't, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, you know, we're fortunate in Deerfield right now because tape Julie is as sharp as a tack. Videotape, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Some I know, know, she, we don't know how to use a re uh, you know, search button. Yeah, she's great. She's she's a hell of an asset for us. What is Julie? Kevin on Kevin on the finance committee. I mean, she's sharp, mm -hmm. I and mean, she understands stuff. As long as she remains on the finance committee for a period of time, long enough to remember and recall this for us, it's great. Yeah. But if she happens to get frustrated and not be there in a year or two, yeah. But I. Which has happened. Well, it's, and here again, we're starting that we're got all the committees starting to work together at, uh, in joint meetings instead of. So we're ironing out some of these problems ahead of time now. Okay. What's um, next, Zach? Um, there was a question at the last BOO meeting about where we were on the parking lot. Yeah. And well, I, was, I, I was wondering that when I was walking in today. In the exhaust. Um, that has all been squared up by Kevin Scarborough, um, and it is on the docket after the first of the year. So this fiscal year, but um, they, ain't, they ain't paving in January. No, no. But like, no, but like, warmer weather. I guess my point was this update came when it was still warm out, and so and his point was it's not going to happen until it's you know spring summertime again. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but those are all set. <laughs> Kevin has. This is his forte. I was complaining. Do you feel board, board meeting? Suck board meeting. Sure. Um, so those and are still. Diesel exhaust, I've heard that. I've heard the chair. No, that's the same thing. Okay. So he had to. The chair is awful tough. So I heard. Okay. Um, but that's an OSHA requirement. It shouldn't be held off. Kevin was managing the. It, that's also happening this fiscal year. We have yeah. the capital approval for that. It's getting paid for out of the lease payments for the building. Yeah. Um, they just what? did it over at the South Deerfield Fire Station, and there is, um, there are some competing companies, and one is particularly nasty, and so yeah. Yeah. he's yeah. like, yeah. I, he was like, nope, this is great. I've already done this once. Now I know exactly how to like, you know, make sure exactly what this bid needs to look like and all that stuff, and, and, sure. and make sure I have the documents on hand when yeah. they are requested and stuff. So, um, so that that is also that is full steam ahead. So, so not before winter time. Correct. Not before winter time. Okay. COVID-related supply chain issues. Yeah. Actually, some of it is. Yeah. No, I, I say it kind of tongue in cheek, but yeah, maybe it may, and then you have issues with installers and general contractors all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's there and someone's working on it. 
Greenfield Community College has approached us. So the paramedic program is part of your paramedic education. You're required to, the last thing you do is ride with practicing paramedics in the field. Um, and they are hounded every class twice a year um, by the paramedic students asking about South County. And we are the only municipal EMS third service um, also available to these students. Um, they're right now. Why, why are you waiting? Yeah. So, uh, right. What happens is, um, so they have a they have a standard contract, right? These students are covered under the school's insurance and, and malpractice and stuff like that. Um, and they also have a basically a precepting program. So anybody that we identify here, the school would um, make sure that they are qualified and um, skilled in order to conduct the that awesome. oversight. Um, on our end, we need to figure out how to compensate our people um, if they're going to take on those additional roles. And so that gets back to the conversations I had previously about, um, you know, for your hours with a third rider in which you are responsible not just to the patient but also to this other practicing paramedic and all that stuff. Um, for the good of the community. Um, like. Typically, it would be like an extra dollar an hour during those precepting hours or things like that. Um, though the malpractice insurance by that um, student is covered by the college, ultimately the state Department of Public Health Office of Emergency Medical Services says that that paramedic is responsible for the well-being of the patient. And so there is now um, extra responsibility and liability on that paramedic who chooses to do that role in that they can more easily lose their car because of something a student does or something. So um, I was on vacation. One of my to-do lists with Casey is to figure out whether there is even a mechanism in the bylaws that could allow for that type of thing to occur just very simply. Oh, four of these hours and this paycheck were spent you know, mentoring a paramedic student, here's an extra four dollars type thing. So how does the other towns handle it? Uh, normally it's written into a collective bargaining agreement. Um, I know AMR, the private services, they do offer an hourly stipend um, as a field like as a supervisor or field training officer. Usually it's um, one or the other. Um, a supervisor would be paid that every hour all the time um, or um, just the field training people would be when they're when they're doing it. So you, you pay people when they're riding on the bus, or are you paying them the entire day? Any time that they are responsible, and that is because the part of the education and part of the reason why they want South County is not just because of the patient care. They can get patient care anywhere. It's part of the what does a EMS service look like? What is that culture? What How do we check a truck? How do we maintain our equipment? How do we... Um, you know, in your downtime, practicing your skills, pulling out the IV arm, the intubation mannequin, things like that. Um, and there is that expectation that these paramedic students ju ju don't just sit around, that they, um, they come in, they start at the start time of the shift, um, and, they, and they do that all together. It, it also creates a little bit of a pipeline for us for additional staff down the line. You'll get a look at who the students are, you get a look at the ones that... Mm -hmm you may be interested in hiring on and the ones that you may not be interested in hiring on. Yeah, well, I've been adjunct faculty at the GCC paramedic program for over 10 years now, and I use it kind of as a farm team that these these people will inevitably usually apply here, mm -hmm. um, either usually full time. Um, yeah. But right, exactly, kn knowing, having that eyes on them. And I know Northampton Fire usually does that as well. That's one of the reasons why they, they provide that service to GCC because a lot of those people will then later on apply for a job there. And I can tell you that those those of you who teach and have taught in the past can have a very big impact on the lives of those folks as they get going in this career. So personally I'm on board, I think it's a good thing to figure out what Casey you may need to do a little bit of homework about what different services pay so you've got something yep. that you can present to her. Yep, and I need to figure out what language GCC has, whether they have some boilerplate for what the actual job responsibility is, um, and because that'll obviously need to be in writing, because if, if somebody is going to be allowed to take on that responsibility, they should be held to a standard, and, um, and that should be maintained. 
Um, Do they do with the basic course at all? No, it, well, it's at least it's not a requirement. I know that a lot of basic courses offer it as an option um, to do ride time, and we have a mechanism here that was set up in the under the Deerfield EMS days for third rider observer ride time, simply just shadowing, not yeah. part of a program. Mm -hmm. right. um, and that's something that we occasionally participate in here, but I don't. the basic program doesn't have the requirement the same way the paramedic program does. Part of the accreditation is that they have to... Remember way back when they used to send you to the emergency room right. to observe? Yeah. Yeah. They should do that. And, and, and one of the changes recently, it used to just be straight, you needed X number of skills and X number of hours. And now part of the accreditation is that they were specific. You need those things, but also your last, I forget what it is, 80 hours has to be at the same department or has to be with the same preceptor because they want that consistency. They don't want people bouncing around and then, you know, not knowing what areas they need to work on and whether there's growth. That you are with one person that, that you jive well with who is a good match mm -hmm. and that they, they watch your maturation and, and work on the things that need to work on. So. Okay. Um, yeah, um, so there's that. Uh, do I, do we want, do we need to vote on the two people thing? Or is that like the two people? The two full timers at it, reallocating that money in the budget for the? I think when you get ready to put the budget, the final budget together, yeah. Well, he's looking to do it. As, he's looking to do that soon. As an operational change immediately. So that's so we're seeing this is your final budget? No. We're not talking about next year's budget. We're talking about the current year rent. Yeah. He's looking to reallocate some of that money to hire the full two the two full timers. And he's looking to do that. And based on the calculations, we'll save money by the end of the year based on what our current budget is. So it's not gonna have a budgetary impact. Um, and then working up looking at the FY twenty three budget, it would cost less money compared to what it would be if we didn't affect the change, which is why I'm bringing it now. I, I gra Personally, I'd rather that we have at least somebody from Whiteley here also. Um, so I don't care if you have another meeting in a couple weeks. I have Gary Stone in writing in an email saying he thinks it's a great job. <laughs> That's thinks not, that it thinks that's it's a great idea. That's not the person from what they was talking about. <laughs> and I, I did text him and asked him where he was tonight. He said he's at another meeting. So, um, it, I mean, if we think, you mean TF? <laughs> um, John Edwards, right? John Edwards, come fight and give us. I think it's a great one side of the bridge. I I think it's a great idea. I think <laughs> fiscally it's a no-brainer, and it's basically. Um, my like primary motivation right now as far as trying to run this department and keep it operational from just a purely operational standpoint um i think it's a no-brainer um so whatever we need to do whatever i need to do to convince you um that well, in theory you can as long as you're staying within your budget you can just bring those people on without approval from us it's, I, I mean, it's not fundamentally changing what we're doing. We're not providing expanded services to new communities. We're actually, it's a way to solidify mm -hmm. what we've already agreed to do as a board of oversight. Yeah. But I also didn't want to just do it without this board's giving us the professional courtesy to keep us informed and allow us to weigh in on it and give us the opportunity to ask questions, which I think is the right thing to do. I, I agree with you. I'm on board. I think it's... As long as it's not going to cost us any more money, it's in the best interest of the service. Um, Tom made his point earlier about if it doesn't work out and we need to make a change next yeah. year, I, I, I don't know. Look at the numbers. Everything just keeps going like this, short of COVID. Right. And we're heading back in that direction again. And I think we have to, we're going to need to have these tough conversations going forward about mm -hmm. additional staffing later on. But I think at this point, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and my point with this is, this is just to meet the demands of what we're doing now. This isn't even anticipating another 10% or 12% increase in call volume. <laughs> this is to meet the demands that we have Meet the currently. demands in, in, in reaction to current staffing challenges. 
And if our call volumes go down to 100 calls a year, then we can just fire six people. That ain't happening. <laughs> no, the firing piece, but the call volume's going down. Mm -hmm. um, sure I'm, betting, right? I'm betting when the neighbors to the north get going, it'll bring some increased traffic and some increased call volume as well over time. Possibly. Maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, because of what the, the venue was presenting, mm -hmm. you're going to probably have to have, between police and EMS, somewhat involved there. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think it'd be irresponsible of the town if we don't have that yeah. involvement in line of communication. Yeah. So. Like I said, right now, right, we've got, we have no intrinsic coverage for Deerfield, Sunland, and Whaley because we're in Amherst. Um, but they just had a call before. Like, no, that was it. I actually just heard them sign off on scene in Amherst, and so that oh. made me pull that up. Um, so, right, like, yeah. So, do we need to vote to give him the ability to go hire two full-timers, or can he just do it because he's operating within the budget? <laughs> well, it, well, I, and again, for, for me, I'll it, entertain a motion. You can make a motion. You'll, you'll have, you know, you'll have to come to the town for the official appointment. Oh, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, there would be there would be a posting, there yeah. would be an application, yeah. there would be, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's expense. My, my only... And again, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. I'm, I'm talking I'm talking as a member of town meeting floor, sure. okay? So if you're a finance committee, okay, you voted on this budget, and this budget was presented to have this amount of people, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Now, during the course of the year, I'm just saying if I was if I was sitting in the audience, okay, and all of a sudden I go back and think, oh, we're, and, and this happens with the FERCOC budget every year. It happens with the schools every year, too. And, 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 and I, I'm, going to I'm going to ask you a question. Do you feel comfortable when the schools do it? I don't feel comfortable in the fact that the schools seem to do it every year and it never gets addressed. And, and they play the game of let's have hire all these per diems that wind up working a couple hours over. Now they all need to be full time benefited, and then next year we need to bring more. My thing with this is at least it's he's shifting, he's shifting around his hours. The money is going to stay under budget. It's going to save the town money. I guess my thought is this. If we vote to approve this, it's got to come before select board to get a final. So that gives the opportunity. opportunity. Well, not the final, just for just the appointment. Point. Yeah. So it gives the opportunity if Waitley's got heartache with it, they can object them. I guess we can call another meeting to come back to this again. But Zach, well, was, was, yeah. Zach was clear in his email that he sent out that this was one of the points he wanted to talk about tonight. He had intentions of trying to get approval to move forward with it tonight. And we changed the date. And asked that we all be here for the meeting. So, and, and nothing against Gary and Jonathan. I know things come up. I know people get busy. And I'm not casting stones. I just, I don't want to hold this up and back that process up for another four or five weeks until we can get there. So with all that being said, if you're looking for a motion, I'll make a motion to give Zach permission to hire two more full-time employees with the caveat that we're going to stay within your budgeted labor expense for the current fiscal year. No second. Discussion. The only other discussion <laughs> I got is, you know, you stay the way you are now and paramedics A, B, and C are going to be continuing to get overtime and it leads to burnout too. You know, you're not just getting a lot of overtime. You're you're here all the time. I I've noticed, particularly in the past year, an increasing number of staff that, from my perspective, are kind of martyring themselves a little bit because they have so much pride in the department and maybe against their better judgment, you know, they're agreeing to come in, you know, on that day off because they would they would rather be here and miss out on a family activity 
then be at the family activity and know that you know we're just we're at the basic level right. and we're requiring an intercept from Greenfield or Amherst or Northampton or something mm -hmm. like that. So, um, you know, as a means to provide the department and the personnel with the resources they need to do their job in a healthy and safe manner. Um, and be able to look the community in the eye and say, like, yeah, we're meeting, we're meeting what you've asked us to do, which is provide an ambulance 24 seven. All so the staff is, a, staff is a, the, the, the biggest expense of those. It systems. always is. It, it always is. That's why I said, I, 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 and I think that's one of the things that we said, right, staff, and that's why we want to start slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I just said, Philosophically, I have a, I have a concern. My concern is changing what we presented to the town. So my vote will be because my philosophical, and it's not right for one department, so it shouldn't be right for the other. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I says that's how it is. What we presented, but we're not pulling I'm, the rug out from underneath anybody. We're not increasing the budget, he's actually trying to add people and lowering the budget. Mm -hmm. We'll see if that happens. And I think it's in reaction to challenges that have been brought on by the situation that we happen to be in that we were in part of this, right. the whole budgeting process went on, but we, we thought by last spring everybody was going to get a shot in the arm and life was going to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, and I respect it. I, I know, I, and, and again, I, I, I would be. Yeah, no. I, I mean, for 23 years, six months, I've been very consistent. Yes, no, <laughs> and what I've said. So I can't, I can't change who I am. No, and I, don't, I don't want you Actually, to. 22 I, years, six months. It's one of the things yeah. I respect about who you are and what you bring to the table because you've always got a different point of view, which yeah, we, we should have discussions that. about. Yeah. I think for me, when I present budgets and operations, the question I'm answering is, or what I'm addressing is the service that they want. And so when I present a budget, I say, hi, I'm here to give you one ambulance at the paramedic level 24-7 with an additional bit of staff during the day. And this is what it costs based on how I think I'm going to accomplish it. And in hindsight, six months through this fiscal year, I'm still providing the same thing that I told them I would provide. It just turns out it's going to cost a little bit less based on this is how I'm now going to pivot and full time employees never cost less staff. Well, they cost I, they I cost mean, they more cost less today on the paper, but when you start adding longevity and their salaries are going up. And, and the vacation goes from one week to two weeks to three weeks. That sick yeah. time goes from three days to four days to right. five days. Yep. Insurance goes from single to family. I, yep. I, I just, yep. and again, if you take right now, you look at your budget, what percentage of your budget is labor? The vast majority of it. You say 70%? More, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So now you just added more. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. I don't, so I don't, I don't know. And that's, that's all I'm saying is that labor is expensive. And, yeah. and, and if, if it's needed, that's fine. Yeah. But I, it's the most I expensive. Think he, I think he's shown it. He needs it. But how do you know I can't read it? <laughs> <laughs> personnel costs are we're putting the uh, expense Carol? on the heads of the ones that are working presently if we don't right. give him, you know, they're working. Harder than mm -hmm. they I, need to work. I, I get elected for 3,500 people. I yeah. hear you. Okay. I, I, I worked for you for 16 years, too. I know. I remember. I'm here on the other side. I know. Yeah. So I almost 70% almost of the budget is yeah. labor. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and, and that's why I said 70%, because that's. Yeah. And, and, that's why, and that's why people so talk just, about school budgets. Just, just pretend labor is a school budget. Oh. I, and, and I've always said that <laughs> labor, school budgets are what they are because of labor. Yeah. And, the and, number and, one reason we started this service was because we couldn't cover our 
on a volunteer basis. Yeah. Three towns, and yep. I don't Absolutely. want to see him going backwards. Yep. And I agree. I, I don't want. I would rather have this discussion about labor than be sitting here having discussion about we missed five calls and somebody passed away because we couldn't get an ambulance. Right. Mm -hmm. We've been on the other side. We've all been on the other side of that discussion years and ago, and I don't want to go back. a lot there. more calls than we ever did. Yes, presently, at a higher level, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't think there is. I won't say there's nobody, but there are very few who could probably complain about the way this service has gone and what's being provided at the cost it's being provided. I don't provided. hear complaints about it. All I hear is, oh my God, there was And to your there. point, if, it, if there was an easy way to bring townspeople together for a town meeting to explain all this and get a vote, great, but we know that would be... It would yeah. cost money to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to do three of them. Right. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, and again, I just... Any yeah. further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Do you stand? No, I'm opposed. Okay. Three one zero. All right. Um, I'm saying so. Uh, we should uh, next year's meeting schedule. Yes. So next fiscal year, or next calendar, calendar year. year. Um, we had originally done January, February, March, June, September, November. Um, do we want to keep to those? This this is all like just I, I want to schedule ahead. Right. If we need to have a meeting, obviously we can call it. If we want to skip a meeting, obviously we don't have to have. Let's it. have the January twenty first meeting, and we'll find out whether we need to have a February meeting or not. Because March should be. Uh, we might want to have an April meeting because we're probably going to move town meeting out. Sure. Deerfield is into like May. You mean? We're going to be around January. We're going to be in Boston January twenty first. Is that your Boston trip? Uh, Some of the year. Those no. Those dates you're looking at are. Is that a Tuesday? No. These dates you're looking at are are calendar year twenty one. So move looking forward, it, it isn't necessarily going to be the twenty first. In fact, I would tell you it won't be the twenty first. Okay. Yeah, um, because well, this meeting is going to be on a Tuesday, and we're leaving there for. But the 21st sounds like a Thursday for some reason. It it's was in 2021, but we're yeah. talking about 2022. So we'd be looking the third Tuesday? So this is the other question in the room. Do we want to move it to Tuesdays, or do we yeah, want... We'll with Tuesdays. To, we're going to do Tuesdays from now on, the third Tuesday? Okay. And Tuesdays are better for me, so... Great. That's all I need here. They're better for Carolyn as well. Um, so the third Tuesday would be the 18th? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Um, yeah, and like you did this month, uh, remind us with your meetings a couple of weeks ahead. That was a good reminder. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm also trying to get the schedule uh, ahead of time. Um, do we want to consider a February? Put it on the books. February 15th. Yep. And we can tell you in January whether we're And then go March 15th, April 19th. Uh, you want an April on the books, right? Yeah. Just instead of March, you mean? No, or? put it in addition to at this point, and then Just we can we can decide in February what we w want to do. February fifteenth. Yes. February fifteenth. I'm presenting at a conference. Ooh. You what? Presenting at a conference. What are you presenting at? Oh, life. Huh? What are you presenting at? Gil Salade Installation. Oh. Seam lines. Me. Nothing. It's my oldest cooking meat birthday. or anything fun. All right, All right. Do you want to move it then to February 8th? <coughs> February 8th yeah. better? Second yeah. Tuesday? February 8th? Yeah. We don't even know if we're going to have one or not. Yeah, in February. Yeah. I think we skipped February this year anyway. Oh, nice. Turkey. January, February, March, oh. April. And then June? Two, three, nice. four. Uh, well, we're putting in an April. Do you want to do another three or just another two and round out to six? June would be after town meetings. So maybe, well, oh. We had the June one because we want to get to the end of fiscal year. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. 
So June 21. 21. And then go out to September 20th. And then November 15th. Sounds good to me. And we'll see where that goes. Do you hear that beeping? And I'll take a motion to adjourn. Anything else you needed? No, I got everything I need. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 1931? Okay. Good. Mm -hmm.